So, hello everyone. Uh, this is FM Arne Jochens speaking and I would like to welcome you to this introductory live lesson for the 900 plus section of the Prodigy program brought to you by ChessUniversity.com. Now, if you're not familiar with Chess University, we are the first live online chess academy and we offer structured online courses, chess in school programs and other educational chess offerings to students around the world. As you can see in the chat earlier, I saw some of the students giving their locations. So we really have students from all over the world also today here. So yeah, maybe I can say more about the Prodigy program at the end of the lesson. But of course, this free lesson today is for everybody to get an impression um, of how these lessons actually look like. So I will be showing you positions, discussing the examples I show you, and I would like to encourage you to ask questions at any time via the chat. Of course, this will be difficult for me today because we have so many students today due to the fact that we are offering this for free, but I will try to do my best to answer as many questions as possible. So this is the 900 plus section, but of course, anybody is free to attend here so you can also attend this lesson if you are rated higher than or maybe even lower than that but um, if you're rated much higher than say 1200 which is the beginning of the next section in the prodigy program then i would like to ask you to not uh, give away too many of the answers to my questions because this would make it hard for me to uh, to keep the right pace in the lesson. Yeah, this will be recorded, Roger, and uh, the video will be available. So our topic here today in this first lesson, which is going to be about one hour long, is typical incorrect assumptions and mistakes that result from those assumptions. And let me include the chat boxes here in the stream so that they will also be shown in the video later. So as you all know already, when playing chess, we always have to make some assumptions. Assumptions are mental shortcuts that can be very useful because unlike computers, a human player is not able to think about every move. So it can be very useful to not think about certain moves, to not even consider them because we know they they will not be good. For example, in the opening, you may not consider retreating your pieces if it's not necessary. And also you wouldn't expect your opponent to retreat their pieces. But sometimes these assumptions can be wrong. And then, of course, the result may be a mistake. And I want to start with an example that contains several different tactical themes. So this is kind of a preview to what is to come in the Prodigy program, because all of these tactical themes are going to be discussed in more detail in future lessons. So this position that you can see on the board here is from a game from the European Team Championship in 1989 between two players called Nori and Hoen from the Finland-Norway match. And it's black to move in this position. Now you can see the material is about equal. Black has a bishop for a knight, but you know they are worth about the same. And Maybe White, in allowing this position, had thought that everything is safe here. Maybe White had seen that White could play the move knight to f3 here. This move is possible because the pawn on g2 is pinned. It is not allowed to capture on f3 because the black queen would then be able to capture the white king which is of course illegal. So in this position, black could play the move knight f3. 
And also, of course, white doesn't want to capture the knight with the queen because then black would capture with the rook and he would have won the queen. But white could simply play the move king h1. So this is probably what white had anticipated. And this need not be a problem for white. Now the knight is attacked, so it would have to move again, most probably. So I guess that white had thought or assumed that everything is safe in this position. But this is not entirely true. Can you spot one piece or pawn in white's position that is insufficiently defended? C2, very good. Ariel was taken and real moon master point out that C2 is insufficiently defended. H2 is also mentioned, but I think H2 is sufficiently defended because it is defended by the king, meaning that even if black would be able to capture on H2 somehow, white could still recapture with the king. So I think H2 is well defended. It's not even attacked at the moment. But c2 is in fact insufficiently defended. White had probably assumed that the queen is defending this pawn against the attack by the knight. But there's also the indirect attack by the black queen to be considered. And this leads to something that is sometimes called an x-ray tactic. Because black can take this pawn on c2 and now the image is that the black queen is x-raying the white queen here and defending the knight through the white queen. So the knight on c2 is actually defended by the black queen, despite the fact that the white queen is in between. In other words, if white were to capture the knight, he would just lose the queen, as you can see. So the move knight takes c2 is possible, and this is what black played, but this is not all. Now black has won a pawn, so that's a good start. But it gets more interesting from here, so let's follow the game. Well, first of all, we should ask ourselves, what should white play? He could take the queen on g6, but black would simply recapture with the rook. And now the rook on a1 is still attacked by the knight. So now it would have to move, but wherever it goes, say it goes to c1, attacking the knight, the black knight could come to e3. And this is a double attack, another typical tactic that will be discussed in much more detail in future lessons. The knight is attacking the rook on f1, and of course, if a knight attacks a rook, this is usually a serious threat to capture the rook because, well, simply because a rook is usually worth more than a knight. And also the knight is attacking the pawn on g2, as is the rook from g6. So despite the fact that the pawn on g2 is defended by the white king, it's threatened to be captured because it is attacked twice. So this is a double attack and black as a result would win a second pawn at least. Okay, let me answer um, the question that Kolbjörn seems to have here about h2 in the earlier position. And also Chess Master Junior has a question, so maybe I should go back a move or two. Kolbjörn is still thinking about uh, the potential weakness of h2. So Kolbjörn says black should play e4 so that the bishop may attack h2. But I'm not sure why this is any good because, as I said, the king is still defending h2. So if white captures this pawn, I, I don't really see the point. 
well, maybe some combination of the moves knight f3 and bishop takes h2 is possible, but well, at least this is not so clear. I like the course that black chose in the game with knight takes c2 more, because as we are about to see, this leads to a winning advantage for black. Okay, and what about knight f3 followed by queen h5? I said knight f3 would be met with king h1. Then we could play queen h5, threatening queen h2, checkmate. But what if white captures the knight then? Then you want to play e4. Okay, I see. This is this could be a good combination of the two ideas, e4 and knight f3. So this is a double attack. The queen is now threatening to capture on h2 with checkmate again, because uh, the bishop is opened up here. And of course the white queen is also attacked. So does white have a defense in this position? Maybe not. Yeah, so this could be very good, but um, Ariel was taking points out that this line is not entirely forced. And this is a very important concept in chess that is also going to be discussed in detail in future lessons. Um, if you analyze such a line, you have to think about whether the, the moves that you assume your opponent is going to make in the line are really the only options for them. And here, well, king h1 is pretty much forced, pretty much white's only option, as we have already discussed. But after queen h5, white does not have to take the knight. So there was a suggestion in the chat to simply play h3 instead. So that now if black plays e4, we may be able to just capture that pawn. And we should capture with the knight probably, so that we prepare to maybe exchange this dangerous bishop. And of course we also attack the rook for the moment. Yeah, so again, this is not entirely clear, at least not to me. It could also be good, but you would have to calculate more. The move in the game is easier to calculate, I think. Knight takes c2, because now... Well, we have already discussed queen takes g6, and if white doesn't want to exchange queens, well, he has to address the threat knight takes a1, so then he has to move the rook. So in the game we played rook a to c1, of course, the rook has a choice of squares, and I'm not saying rook c1 is necessarily the best move, but let's not make it too complicated right now. And now black has a very nice forcing follow-up. This is another typical kind of tactic. You can see the black queen is attacking the white queen, but the white queen is defended by this knight. So capturing the queen would just result in, in an exchange of queens. And whenever this is the case, whenever you notice that one of your opponent's pieces could be captured by you, but then um, this would just be an exchange, so the piece is defended, you should think about this type of tactic called removal of the guard. So as Alo World is already pointing out here, and also Robbie over in the YouTube chat, Black should think about this move rook takes f2. Normally it wouldn't be a good idea to capture a knight with your rook if you lose the rook, but here the idea is that now the white queen 
is no longer defended. So white cannot just recapture on f2 because then he would lose the queen. So what is white supposed to do? Has white just lost a piece? Well, we have to look a bit further still. There's one move for white that avoids an immediate loss of material. Yes, as uh, someone with a name that I can't pronounce mentions, white should take the queen. This is the only move, really. Well, I suppose you could also try queen e4 so that the queen is defended and you defend against black's other threat that I should have mentioned in this position. Black is not only threatening to capture the queen, but also black is threatening to capture on g2 with a checkmate. So either white has to capture on g6 or he could try queen e4, but then black could just exchange queens and even exchange rooks. And black has won a piece. If you count the pieces, you see in the end, say after rook takes f1, black just has an extra piece. So this should be winning. So queen takes g6 was indeed played in the game. And now, of course, if black recaptures the queen, then he would still lose this rook on f2. So then white would have won some material. So what was black's idea in allowing this sequence? He captured the knight on f2, not just because he saw this initial removal of the guard tactic, but he had anticipated this move queen takes g6 and he had seen that he doesn't have to recapture the queen straight away. And this is another very important type of tactic. This is called the in-between move or the Zwischenzug as we say in Germany. And also internationally this word is sometimes used. Zwischenzug is just the German term for in-between move. So the idea is white has just captured the queen, black will have to recapture and it would be an easy mistake to assume that black has to recapture straight away. But this is not true. If you can make a move that creates an even stronger threat than white than the threat that white has in this position, which is to just withdraw the queen. Well, then you can play that move and only recapture on g6 on the next move. So yeah, several people in the chat point out the Zwischenzug here. Rook takes f1. This is a nice Zwischenzug because it is a check. So clearly white doesn't have time to save the queen. Only one question remains, as also already being pointed out in the chat. Isn't the knight on c2 still hanging? Well, first of all, white has to address the check. Now, if the rook takes, then clearly the knight is safe after black captures the queen. So then again, black would have won a piece. But what if the king takes on f1? So that now if black captures the queen, white can capture the knight. And although black has won a pawn, this position is not so clear because the white pieces are quite active. So white may have quite some compensation for the pawn here. But this wasn't black's idea. He had anticipated that in this position he can even play a second in-between move. He still doesn't have to capture the queen. Yes, this is right. Rook f8 is the second in-between move. This is another check. But this time the point is not so easy to see because it seems white can just move the king and black still has the same problem as before, that if he captures the queen finally, his knight is still hanging. But this is a very clever move because it turns out the white king doesn't have a good square. If it goes to g1, then we can indeed 
capture the queen finally. Because in this position the knight is not really hanging anymore. Yes, Alo World and okay, let me try to pronounce that. Throw Girardelli. In this position white cannot take the knight because then black has a check and well white could play rook f2 but then he just loses the rook but other than that he would have to move the king and then black has a checkmate. This is of course another very important type of tactic the back rank checkmate where the black king is checkmated by only one piece because his own pawns get in the way. I don't think it matters whether we play bishop c5 check first or take the queen first. Both should be easily winning. So yeah that's the final point. Well not the final maybe we should also mention what happens after king e2 instead of king f1. Sorry I mean instead of king g1 in this position. And then black even has a third in-between move. Remember the white queen has captured on g6 and instead of recapturing first black took on f1 then instead of recapturing he played rook to f8 and now he still doesn't capture the queen but he plays a third in-between move. Yes, I think you both mean the right move there. Throw Girardelli and please to mate you knight d4 check. This is a very useful in-between move clearly because it saves the knight with gain of time. White still doesn't have time to save the queen because he's in check. And now the knight is completely safe because it is defended by this pawn. So after the king moves anywhere finally black is going to take the queen and again black has won a piece. And this was very much forced. Only white's move rook a to c1 in this position was not entirely forced. So there maybe white has an improvement. But after rook c1 all of this was forced and black was winning by force with this nice move rook takes f2. Double threat and after queen takes g6 instead of recapturing first this Zwischenzug rook takes f1 and then the second Zwischenzug rook f8. So what black is doing he's preparing to save the knight with gain of time. So maybe this is the key line king e2 knight d4 check and then recapture the queen. Uh, Kuya Rashid even continues this line but I think in this position we can stop calculating because now white can clearly not create a great threat and black just has an extra piece. Um, if you just joined the lesson by the way as uh, Glory Gamini is asking uh, you can later watch uh, the video I don't think you can rewind right now in the live stream but the video will later be made available so then you can watch the beginning. Okay so this was an example that included a lot of different tactics and I am aware that this was not at all an easy example and I'm not saying that a 900 player should be able to calculate all of this from the beginning but what I'm saying is that it's very useful to know these tactical ideas and this is one of the best ways to improve at chess to learn as many tactical patterns and tactical ideas as possible. And um, for the remainder of this lesson I would like to focus on this idea of the in-between move. So to make this even more clear let me show you an example which is all about this one idea of the in-between move. 
This is a position that arose in a game from the World Junior Championship in 2005. Uh, white is the woman grandmaster from Germany, Elisabeth Peetz, and black is Irina Vasilievich. And well, for the moment in this position, black has an extra pawn, but white is about to regain that pawn. And both kings are not very secure. Clearly the white king looks a bit odd here on h3, but it's white to move and we will see that the black king is also not safe. So white takes on f5, which regains the pawn. Takes, takes. Yeah, thank you, um, Zulvam X, for helping me out a bit here in the chat, answering some of the questions. I'm afraid I won't be able to answer all of the questions today because there are simply too many of them and I want to, to show you some more examples and also give you some exercises. So in this position black captured on e2. Probably assuming that white would just recapture, right? This is a very typical assumption. Whenever you capture a piece like a rook, you assume that your opponent is going to recapture. But if you are aware of this tactical idea of the in-between move, then you know that this is not necessarily true. So, as Salem has already spotted, white has a very useful in-between move in this position. White could capture the rook, this would be okay, but as long as we create a threat so that black doesn't have time to save the rook, we don't have to recapture the rook straight away. So we can play this move queen h7. And stay size, so has also mentioned this. Why is this a useful move to play? Well, because now the black king is driven out into the open where it will be an easy target for an attack by white. And this move has to be played right now before recapturing because this move queen h7 is only possible, of course, because the bishop is defending the queen. As soon as white captures on e2, this move queen h7 would no longer have been possible. So white plays this move first, and only then does she recapture the rook. And now you can see the black king cannot get back, because the white queen is still controlling that square. So the black king is caught in the open here, and white has two threats in this position either check by this bishop would be very awkward for black. The immediate bishop c4, by the way, is not as convincing because, well, it may even be a mistake because, say, after queen h7, king f7, if we play bishop c4 here, then black can use the rook to defend. So if you want to play an in-between move, you really have to make sure that your opponent doesn't have time to save the piece that is attacked. Well, maybe rook e6 doesn't exactly save the rook, but at least black will keep some extra material because the rook is now defended by the pawn. And black is a full rook up, so if white captures on e6 and loses the bishop in the process, white will still have lost a piece overall. Okay, it's true, you can play f5 and this will regain the piece. But is this really winning? I'm not so sure, because now maybe black can start a counter-attack here. 
Remember, the white king is also not very safely placed. Well, maybe this is also winning, I'm not sure. Uh, white is threatening to take on e6 with a double check, because the rook on f1 would also give a check. So this is a very strong threat. Yeah, I suppose this is also winning. But let's see what happened in the game, because I don't think black has a defense anyway. White simply captured the rook immediately, well not immediately, but in this position after queen h7 she captured the rook. And now as I mentioned there are both of these threats, bishop c4 and bishop h5, and black cannot prevent both of them at once. She tried d3, and now again there may be several moves that win, so let me just show you what happened in the game. Bishop h5, king e6, queen takes d3. And now this bishop is attacked, and there is a threat to play f5 which would be checkmate. Note that the white queen is now covering the d5 square and the bishop is covering f7. Well, not checkmate immediately, but uh, I think it would be checkmate in a few moves. Maybe you should calculate that. If black saves the bishop, well, this is actually what happened in the game. So if black saves the bishop, f5, king f6 is the only move. But now there's queen d4 check. Well, I suppose you could even say this wins the bishop, but the main point is the black king is now going to get checkmated. Because this bishop is covering f7, the other bishop is covering e6, the pawn is covering e7, I mean, and the pawn is covering e6. The king has to come out here, and now queen h4 is just checkmate, finally. Okay, again, this was not easy to calculate to the end, but here it was not necessary, because the main point was just that after this move, queen h7, the king was forced to f7, and it is just too exposed here to have a chance to survive. So the, the further details here do not really matter. White may have several ways to win from here, but they are all based on the fact that the black king is simply too exposed now. So that was because of this nice decision to queen h7. Uh, Chessmaster Junior suggests Bishop B2 instead. Yeah, this may be a better try because at least it would prevent Queen D4 check in that line. But on the other hand, the Bishop is still not defended. So at the very least, for example, White could play Queen E2 with a double attack against the King and the Bishop winning the bishop, but probably also still uh, checkmating the black king very soon. So there was simply no way for black to save this position. It was already hopeless, I think, after the king had been driven out to f7. Okay, now let's do some exercises. starting with an easy one. This was 
a position that occurred in the game Star Menkovic against Molina from a tournament in 2007. And clearly the position is very sharp despite the reduced material because as in the previous example both kings are not very secure. The black king is not very secure because it is in the middle of the board and white still has a queen and a rook. But also the white king doesn't look very safe because this pawn on f3 is taking away some squares. So if black could get some check in with the queen this could be very dangerous for the white king. But it is white to move. And white played the move rook to d4 creating a nice little threat of queen g4 checkmate because the rook would now defend the queen and the queen on g4 would not only check the white king but also take away all these squares. So black defended against that with rook g6 but now the only piece that is defending the rook is the king so white checks the king and if the king moves well let's not discuss that because the most interesting position arises in the game where black decided to take the rook. This is an interesting move because the idea is if white captures the queen then black has time to capture the white queen because now black is not in check. So then black would even be winning. So this is the exercise position. White to move. You can't capture the queen. So what should you do? Answering pawn nudger here in the meantime. Uh, yes, in the previous position of course, I don't know what went through the minds of the players exactly, but I assume that, well, I assume that Black had assumed that after Rook takes e2, White would immediately recapture with the bishop. Yes, you are on the right track here, and I see many correct answers already. So we want to capture the queen, but if we capture the queen straight away, we will lose our own queen and black will be a rook up. So the solution is to give a check first. But we must not just give any check. We should try to give, to give a check in such a way that our queen will be safe on the next move. So that then we can capture the black queen. So queen f7 is maybe unnecessarily complicated. I'm not saying this doesn't work at all, but black can still try rook f6. So then we still have the same problem. We would still have to calculate further because again, if we capture the queen, black could capture our queen. There may be even solutions after this, but I think it's an easier solution to give a, a check that secures our queen straight away. So I think queen d7 is the easiest answer. Because in this way, black cannot block the check and at the same time attack our queen. Because this is a diagonal check, so the rook cannot block and attack the queen at the same time. So this is just game over and indeed black resigned in this position. Because now he has to meet the check and then white is going to take the queen. White will have a queen against the rook and in most cases where there are still such so many pawns on the board this is an easy win okay well done most of you who spotted this let's see the same idea in a slightly more difficult setting from an old game Torre against Petursson. In this position white to move captured this 
knight on c6. Now this looks like a straightaway win of a piece, maybe, because the knight on c6 is attacked twice and only defended once. But we also have to think about the knight on e4, because as soon as this bishop from d5 gets exchanged, the knight on e4 will no longer be defended, and it is attacked by the black queen and the black rook. So I think what black had what Black's reasoning in allowing this position here had been was that if white takes the knight, then black wanted to recapture. And now if white captures the bishop, black wanted to capture the knight on e4. So this was black's idea, and then the position would still be okay. The black king may look a bit odd on h6, but I don't see an obvious way for white to exploit that. So my question to you is, can you see what's wrong with Black's reasoning here? What is wrong about this line? Bishop takes c6, bishop takes c6, queen takes c6, queen takes e4. Black must have assumed that this was just going to result in an exchange of all the minor pieces. Uh, Fro Girardelli says rook d3. Yeah, maybe um, referring to this position where I said I don't see a way for white to exploit the fact that the black king is on h6. Well, in this position white cannot play um, rook d3 because the queen is attacked. So maybe you're saying that in this position white should play rook d3 this would indeed threaten rook h3 with checkmate on the next move because the knight is covering g5 and the queen is covering g7. But black may have a defense here. If he can get the king to g7, then the king may be reasonably safe. Or maybe the king can even come out to g5 in some lines. For example, if you want to play in this way as white, you have to consider the move rook takes e4 here, because this clears the g5 square for the king. So after rook h3, king g5, are you sure you can checkmate the black king here? It looks dangerous for black, but I'm not so sure. So in the game white found a straightforward win. And rook d3 is, is not straightforward. Someone is saying queen d7, but I'm not sure in which position. Ah, maybe at the end of this line, bishop takes c6, bishop takes c6, queen takes. Do you mean in this position you want to play queen d7? But I'm not sure that is so strong. Can black not just play a defensive move like rook e7 here? This still looks pretty equal to me. So again, the question is, in this line, bishop takes c6, bishop takes c6. Well, bishop takes c6 is forced, right? There is no in-between move for black in this position, I think. But maybe there is an in-between move for white in this position. White wants to capture the bishop, but if he does, his knight is also going to be lost. So, keeping in mind what we saw in the previous examples, 
Can you find a way to save the knight with gain of time? And maybe then capture the bishop? Okay, Ariel has an idea to play knight f6 as an in-between move. That's interesting because it attacks the rook and also the bishop is still attacked. But there may be an easy solution for black in that he can move the rook and defend the bishop at the same time. For example with rook e6. This saves the rook, it saves the bishop by defending it, and at the same time it also attacks the knight. So this seems like a good solution for black. So knight f6 doesn't quite work, but you're on the right track. Yes, took Markov is right. Knight d6 instead. This is better because this rules out rook e6 as a potential defense. Because now with rook e6 we can still take the bishop. And also it rules out it rules out rook c8 because the knight covers that square as well. But the idea is the same as with knight f6. The idea is that now the rook is attacked and the bishop is still attacked. And chess knight also suggested this move. And over in the YouTube chat, Nacho Taco and Yanis and Final Gear all suggested this move. Well done, knight d6 is winning. This is a winning in between move, which is not obvious, but once you think about it, you will see black doesn't have a satisfactory defense from here. He will lose some material no matter what he does. Okay, so maybe um, black had to play something else earlier, but I don't think there is any improvement. I think white was already winning by force from here. So one idea that is mentioned in the chat is maybe black should have met bishop takes c6 with rook c8. That's an interesting idea because now the bishop is pinned to the white queen. So maybe black can regain the piece in this way. But there is a problem now white can unpin the bishop with gain of time. As Ariel was taking points out, queen h3 is winning for white. This is a check and after the check white can just take on b7. So white is even winning two pieces here. So I think white played in the most precise way. Bishop takes c6, but also black didn't really have a way to save the game from here. Bishop takes c6 was played, but then knight d6 was winning for white. And well, some more moves were played. Rook e6, queen takes c6, and black tries to regain the piece in this way. But again, white has a way to unpin well, not, not really unpin, but white just plays knight takes f7 check. It turns out the knight was not truly pinned because it can still legally move. And if it can move with a check, as it does, then clearly black doesn't have time to capture the queen. And now black resigned because there's a nice final point. If the queen takes on f7, white would like to take the rook on d8, but his own queen is also still hanging. So we have the same 
tactical idea again and again here. Now white can play an in-between move, saving the queen with gain of time, and only then capture the rook. Yes, very good. E P P P M M M and others. Queen C1 check. A very nice final touch. This was not played in the game. Black had resigned seeing this idea now. But this is a check and then white is going to take the rook. So another way to think about this is that these in-between moves will often lead to double attacks. Such an in-between move is, is a peculiar way to create a double attack. As you can see in this position, the queen is attacking the king and the rook is still attacking the rook on d8. Okay, I think we have a bit more time here. So let me show you another one from a game by Magnus Carlsen against Hikaru Nakamura from the London tournament in 2010. Well, in this position, I think black already has a concrete problem because the white pieces are so active. It's black to move, but we are going to look at it from white's point of view because uh, the most interesting moment will arrive after two moves from here with white to move. But first it's black to move and why does black have a problem here? We should note white is not really threatening to take this bishop because then black could play rook c1 and the white queen would be pinned and lost. So rook takes a2 is not a threat but apart from the rook on a1 all the other white pieces are very active and the black king is exposed. And this is his main problem here. The black king is exposed because the f-pawn is not on f7. If the pawn were on f7, black's position would probably be okay. But as it is, well, the bishop has to keep guarding this diagonal. But also the king is potentially vulnerable to an attack against the seventh rank. So white may play rook d7 the queen would have to move and the rook would cover the seventh rank and for example in combination with the queen coming to g7 this could be a mating attack. I'm not saying white is winning by force, I'm just saying that black has a problem and that white's pieces are very active and this makes black's position very difficult to handle. White has several attacking ideas with these active pieces and it's very hard to defend against all of them, to anticipate all of them. But first it's black to move anyway, so what should black do? Well, he chose an interesting move. He could simply retreat the bishop, even though white is not immediately threatening to take the bishop after any move by white that would secure the king, for example after king h2, in the future white would be threatening to take the bishop. So it would make some sense to save the bishop straight away even if it's not threatened to be captured right now. So black could think about this move bishop f7 for example. And this is not a bad move but well, the white pieces are still very active and white could improve the position of his pieces even more. For example, he could centralize the queen with queen to d4. And again, white is not necessarily winning, but white has, has some initiative, as we say, meaning that white has several ways to create threats and this makes the position hard for black to play. Uh, 
there is some talk here in the chat about d5 so I'm not sure bishop d5 is a threat at this moment I think it would just lead to some exchanges rook d8 doesn't work because or are you saying rook d8 for white? In this position it's black to move and black cannot play rook d8 because white could simply capture that rook and the queen would defend. Well, Nakamura had an interesting idea. He played rook c1. And this does work tactically but it also does allow white to win a pawn at least. But maybe Nakamura had seen that and he had concluded that he would rather be a pawn down in a more simplified position than to be in a position with equal material where white is so active. So maybe he just wanted to exchange some of the active white pieces. So first of all, how does this work tactically? Well, the queen is pinned and she is attacked, so white doesn't have a choice. Well, maybe he does have a choice in how to capture on c1, but it's clear he has to capture this rook. But also in how to capture, he doesn't really have a choice because if the queen captures, then black can capture with the rook, check, and white cannot win this second rook because his rook on d6 is also still hanging. So this would lead to a position where black has a queen against the rook, so black would be winning. So rook c1 is very forcing, white has to capture with the rook. And now the idea was to capture again. And this is the critical position here. Now it seems that white has to capture the rook. And I'm not sure whether Nakamura had maybe simply overlooked this. Maybe he had assumed that white would have to recapture this rook and then he would capture on d6. So this would just have led to an exchange of all the rooks. And this would certainly be in black's interest in that it would make it easier for him to defend the position. So can you spot the in-between move here? Why is the assumption that white has to recapture on c1 straight away wrong? Which in-between move can we play? Okay, several suggestions, uh, but only one, well, two, two correct answers in the Twitch chat and one, two, also two correct answers in the YouTube chat. Rook d8 is not the answer because, remember, the white queen on d1 is not only attacked, she is also pinned. So rook d8 could simply be met with queen takes d8 and white must not capture the queen because his own queen is pinned to the king. So white would still have nothing better than to recapture on c1 finally and this would still lead to equal material. But rook takes g6 is the correct answer. Rook takes g6 is a special kind of Zwischenzug, sometimes called a desperado move, because this rook was going to be lost anyway, so in being lost it tries to capture as much material as possible, winning a pawn. This is a check, so black has no time to take the white queen he has to take the white rook and now white recaptures on c1. So white has won a pawn. Now this is not necessarily winning for white but well with Carlsen's great endgame technique he went on to win this anyway. Kuya Rashid again continues this line but I think at this point we can stop calculating because black doesn't really have a way to create any threats here. So white's position is completely safe. White has a safe extra pawn. 
This was played in London in 2010. So yeah, let me let me wrap up uh, this lesson here uh, by saying or by summarizing what we have seen here. So we have seen that assumptions are present in many positions in chess. For example, when you capture a piece, you will often assume your opponent has to recapture. But this can be dangerous because this is not always true. Sometimes there may be this typical tactic of the in-between move. So what can you do to avoid these incorrect assumptions? Well, of course, the first step is to be aware of your assumptions, to be aware that you will often tend to think that when you capture something, there will be an immediate recapture, and then you can consciously look for those in-between moves. But also, as, is, um, as will be discussed in much more detail in the lessons to come in this section of the Prodigy program, it's very useful to be aware of how forcing your moves are. So when you capture a piece or when your opponent captures one of your pieces, this is usually quite forcing in that most of the time you will be forced to recapture, but not if you can make an even more forcing move. And often that will be a check, as we have seen. These in-between moves are very often checks. So there is a hierarchy of moves in how forcing they are. The checks are the most forcing kinds of moves and the captures are usually uh, ranked second. And then the third most forcing kind of move we could say are threats in general, other kinds of threats apart from checks and captures. So, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. I'll again try to to look at the chat a bit more closely right now. But I should also point out um, what is to come in this month of the Prodigy program. Of course, this was the free lesson, so not all of you are going to be in the full course. But, well, if you like this lesson, we would be very pleased, of course, to welcome you in in the full program. And if you're not sure, you can go to chessuniversity.com and let me give you the direct link for this section, the 900 plus section. Under this link here, you can find um, the Prodigy program 900 plus section month one. So this is this month. and. If you click on um, curriculum, you will find the syllabus, among other things. But the syllabus um, is free to watch for anybody, so you can take a look at that to see what is to come in this month of the Prodigy program. Briefly, uh, we have three more live online lessons that are on Saturdays, always the same date as today. Saturday, 10.30 a.m. Pacific time. And we also have six hours of video lessons. So the, these are eight 45 minute video lessons where many of these tactical themes that I touched upon today will be discussed in more detail. And we have a study guide that gives you a lot of suggestions of what to look at, um, how to study and what you can do on your own in between those lessons. And there will also be lecture notes accompanying the lessons and there will be a puzzle packet and a video discussing the solutions to those puzzles. And at the end of the month, we will have a final quiz and also a solution video for that. And of course, um, the students in the program will have the option to email us with any questions in case there are problems or there are just questions about the lessons. Yeah, and the tuition for the full package is $99, but there's also a light option. Let me give you the link for that as well. 
if you go to this link then you have the option to sign up for just the live lessons but nothing else and this is going to be $25. And of course this weekend we still have the free lessons, the first live lessons in all the other sections so you are of course free to watch them as well. Um, this could also be useful if you're not sure which section to join or if you just want to enjoy some more chess then I can recommend watching the other lessons. Uh, let me mention the schedule for that as well. So in about 20 minutes from now we have Fidel Master Dalton Perrine with the first live lesson for the 1200 plus section this month and his topic is going to be evaluating forcing pawn moves. And tomorrow we have three lessons with International Master Kostya Kavutsky the first one being at 9 a.m. Pacific time and that is the 2000 plus section and then at 10.30 a.m. Pacific time he has the lesson for the 1750 plus section and at noon Pacific time he has the lesson for the 1500 plus section. So these are all free to watch the very same channel as this one here so you can just stay here. Okay let me see if there are any questions that I can quickly answer here before we have to clear the channel for Dalton. Yeah, thank you for your feedback here th saying to the people saying thank you and that you liked the lesson. I appreciate that. Um, there's a question, do the mating threats equal checks in terms of how forcing they are? And the answer is no, they do not. Mating threats are not as forcing as checks because if you can meet a mating threat with a check, then the check will have to be addressed and your opponent won't have time to execute the checkmate. Okay, the question about costs I did already answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. The videos will also be posted at chessuniversity.com. Um, although I suppose you could also um, get them from Twitch or YouTube directly, but on chessuniversity.com there will be an edited version and we will also make this free for everybody of course for this first live lesson. Kuya Rashid says this was too difficult. <laughs> well, I'm aware, as I said, that uh, some of the calculations involved in these examples were quite difficult, but I did want to, to give a bit of an outlook on what is to come in terms of tactical ideas and tactical patterns, as I mentioned in the beginning. Any good books? Uh, well, this is a very broad question. We don't have any recommended text books um, in the 900 plus section specifically for this month. But if you want to learn um, tactical patterns, I can recommend one book by a German uh, Fide master called Vitechnik. Let me spell that in the chat. Vitechnik. I'm not sure about the title of the book, but it is a book on tactics and um, I like it very much because the ordering is very clear and he he has a chapter on basically every important type of tactical pattern. So that's very useful to learn these tactical ideas. Dicheska says audio went in and out. Yeah, that's not good. I'm not sure this is a problem for everybody, but usually Twitch is good at handling this many viewers. <laughs> Thank you, NP Lazy. NP Lazy. Yeah, and thank you everybody who says that you learned something, you got something out of this. I really appreciate that. Uh, 
Um, I suppose Karaf can also send you an email with a direct link to Vimeo for the video, but I think the easiest way is you if you just go to the 900 plus section course page. I posted the link above and if you click on the curriculum tab there, you will later find the video there and it will be free for everybody to watch also if you don't sign up for the course. Ah, oh, thank you, Stay Size. So yeah, this is the book I had in mind. Chess Tactics from Scratch. There will be a lot of lessons about pawn structures because, uh, well, this is the basic of the basis of positional chess, understanding pawn structures. Maybe not so many in the 900 plus section, but already in the 900 plus section we have some lessons on weak pawns, doubled pawns, for example. And in the higher sections we have more um, specific lessons about certain pawn structures. Okay. Yeah, so I think uh, we should wrap it up so that you can take a break in case you want to watch the second lesson for today as well. Again, this is going to be with Fide Master Dalton Perrine in about 18 minutes from now. And this is the 1200 plus section. He's going to talk about evaluating forcing pawn moves. So feel free to watch that one as well. And thank you everybody for your attention. And I hope to see you soon in the Prodigy program. Goodbye.